Hello again. Welcome to the second of our Times for Reflection based on the February theme of love. Last week, we reflected on agape, the love that expects nothing back. And then philia, the deep friendship type of love. So what should we tackle this week? Bearing in mind that Monday is St. Valentine's Day, I'm going to begin with the Greek word eros, which is described as passionate love or sexual love. There, I've said it. I've mentioned the word that normally you never hear in church. The three-letter word that begins with an S and ends with an X. It's amazing that from the comforts and the privacy of my own home, I can make reference to what I would never refer to from a church pulpit. But why the hesitation? Why the reticence? As far as most of society is concerned, especially the younger 50%, if you mention love, it's the eros type of love that they are thinking about, not the agape or the philia. For, the, for them, the love that they are most aware of is passionate love. In other words, sexual love. Has the church nothing to say about this much written and much sung about type of love? Let's make one thing clear at the start. As far as I'm aware, you will not find the Greek word eros in the New Testament. But you can't read the New Testament without recognizing that Eros is just off stage. That Eros is there waiting in the wings, ready to make an entrance, as it were. Have you read chapter seven? of Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Chapter seven, verse three, Paul says that a husband and wife should, and I quote, fulfill their marital duty to their partner. Do I have to spell it out? As to what Paul is referring to, isn't it obvious? In verse 9, he's speaking of those who are unmarried and having recommended staying single, he then says that if they can't control themselves, then they should get married. You might be embarrassed by it, but Paul is talking about sexual love, sexual desires that at times can be difficult to control. 
But what about the Gospels? Matthew mentions adultery six times. Mark mentions adultery three times. Luke mentions adultery twice. Have you ever known adultery where sex hasn't been a factor? But what about John's gospel? It is, in, it is John who, in his gospel, chapter 8, tells us about the woman, the woman who, again I quote, was caught in the act of adultery. Now, before you decide that I am obsessed by this subject, let me make just one other reference that you may not have thought about before. In Hebrews chapter 4, speaking of Jesus, the writer says, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Now, if you believe what's there in your Bible, then you believe that Jesus has been tempted in every way as we are. Are we or have we been tempted sexually? Surely the answer is, of course then we have to accept, we have to acknowledge that Jesus, that Jesus, the Son of God, experienced sexual temptation. I would want to go a step further and say that if he wasn't tempted, then he wasn't fully human. Now, I believe that Jesus was fully human and that he was tempted. But as the Bible reminds us, temptation is not the same as sin. Sin is when you give in to the temptation. Jesus was without sin. Because even though he was tempted, he didn't give in to the temptation. In the Bible, eros, that type of love, the love that involves passion and sexual desires, in the Bible, it's normal. It could even be described as a gift from God. Because does not scripture say that male and female, he created them? And then we're told God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Without Eros, it would have been impossible to fulfill God's command. Without Eros, without sexual love, the human race would die out. When I began to prepare for this time for reflection, I have planned to reflect on two Greek words. 
Eros and another. But it's now quite clear that this will not be possible. Because there's more that needs to be said about Eros. In addition to what I've already referred to. We need to recognize what society was like at the time of the New Testament. Firstly, we, we need to recognize that in many parts of society at that time, a woman was seen as a possession, some thing that the man owned. But we also need to recognize that as Christianity spread throughout the Greek speaking world, many of those different religions were practicing and providing prostitutes. Yes, prostitutes. They were provided in their temples, in their places of worship. This was part of normal Greek life. But then along comes Christianity, which because of the teaching of Jesus, places the woman on an equal level to that of a man. She is no longer an acquired possession. She is now seen as a child of God, one to whom Jesus offers the gift of eternal life. But something else changes. Yes, Eros, the love that is passionate, the love that involves having sexual desires, is now brought into the loving relationship of a man and a woman who choose to give themselves to each other within the bond of marriage. The desires of an Eros type of love are still recognized as normal. They're recognized as God given. They are to be enjoyed. They are to lead to the human race being fruitful and multiplying. But there is a right place and a right time for the Eros type of love to express its desires, to find fulfillment for both the woman and the man. And that right place is within marriage. The Christian attitude to the Eros type of love was in stark contrast with what was seen as normal within the society of that time. For the women and for the men who lived at that time, becoming a Christian and accepting a 
Christ-centered way of life meant living a very different way of life to that which they had previously seen as normal. The warnings that Paul had to give make clear the changes that were required of them. As we think of today's society, What should our attitude be to the God-given gift of an Eros type of love? Are we being true to the teachings of Scripture? Are we failing our young people? by not teaching them the Christian attitude to love in its many forms. I think it's time now that we came together in prayer. Heavenly Father, Maybe we've never done it before, but we give you thanks that you are the source of all true love. Even of the passionate love that causes a man and a woman to have such a desire for each other that they want to spend the rest of their lives together. We give you thanks that without that Eros type of love, none of us would exist. We are amazed that by this incredible type of love, we have the ability to follow your commandments, to be fruitful and to increase in number. For those of us who have enjoyed the blessings of marriage, we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for those who reciprocated the love that we had for them. Many of us are able to thank you that through the relationship of marriage, we have been able to enjoy the love that a parent has for a child. Father, we bless you for the blessings of a loving family. But Father, even as we give you thanks, we recognize that the blessings received by some have not been the experience of others. We pray now for those who long for marriage, but for whom it became an unfulfilled hope and dream. Please, Lord, please will you be with them and please will you find another way of blessing them. We, also, we pray also for those for whom marriage was not a happy and not a fulfilling relationship. 
please, Lord, surround them with your love and bring healing to their hearts and their minds. We pray also for those who long to experience the joys of parenthood, but for a whole variety of reasons, their hopes never became a reality. May the love that they have to give, the love that they wanted to pour out upon their children, may that love be redirected to those in need of being loved. Lord, as we think of our society, as we recognize how your gift is so often misused and cheapened, we ask for your forgiveness. We pray for those for whom Eros is nothing more than a way of generating excitement and fulfilling their short-term desires. Please, Lord, please will you help us as a society to rediscover the beauty of love experienced within the confines of marriage. Finally, we pray for the church, your church. May it not ignore the needs of its young people. May it be given the wisdom to help those who are struggling to make marriage what it's meant to be. May your church recognize and respond to the needs of those who are single, whether that be by choice or not. O oh God of all true love, hear and respond to our prayers, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Barry.